afternoon. My name is Melinda Herring. I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Thank you for staying for part two. And this panel is going to be a little complicated because Senator Johnson is going to come in the room in seven to ten minutes. So we're going to pause our panel and our discussion and give the, the microphone to Senator Johnson. So please bear with us. But this panel is about the domestic reforms in Ukraine. Our question is, what can be done to ensure that Ukraine succeeds? Before we dive into the panel, we owe, I owe a number of thank yous. Ambassador Herbst and I have been thanked a number of times. We don't deserve the thanks for this. Uh, I'd like to thank specifically Nick in Representative Captor's office. He did an amazing job making this event possible. And I'd like to thank our staff, Shelby, Colby, Michael, Adrian, Doug, and Adair, and our events team at the Atlantic Council. You are phenomenal. Congratulations on a terrific event. Can you all help me thank them? <clears throat> terrific, thanks. So among heads of state, Volodymyr Zelensky may have the hardest job in the world. I don't know if you've had a chance to read Franklin Foer's excellent article that just came out in The Atlantic, but I really encourage you to take a look. Zelensky, of, of course, was elected on the prom a couple of promises this year. He was elected on the promise of bringing peace and prosperity and finally stamping out corruption in Ukraine. Of course, there's many obstacles to these goals. I made at least four, and Russia, Russia, Russia uh, it was at the top of the list. The other obstacles are obvious. Oligarchs and entrenched elites, a complex U.S.-Ukraine relationship, and waning support in Ukraine, as we've discussed on the first panel. Since he was elected, and since the parliamentary elections this year, there's been a huge amount of activity in the RADA. There's been a raft of legislation that's been passed, and frankly, it's been really, really hard to keep up with everything that the RADA is doing. Much of it is positive in my assessment. There's been a package of anti-corruption bills that have passed. There's bills that have made it easier to do, to do business as well. But Ukraine is still the poorest country in Europe, and the war has entered its fifth year. So our panel is really going to focus on the question of war and peace and on corruption and prosperity. Now, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce five terrific uh, top Ukraine experts and foreign policy thinkers. All the way on my right is Glenn Howard from the Jamestown Foundation, Jonathan Katz from GMF, Dr. Alina Polyakova from Brookings, Paul Stronsky, Dr. Paul Stronsky from Carnegie, and all the way on the left is Luke Coffey from the Heritage Foundation. Thank you all so much for joining us. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, sorry, the, the, the other left. <laughs> don't, 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 we're not inferring anything. Luke, I'd like to start with you on, on this question of war and peace. Uh, can you please bring us up to speed and remind us how much the U.S. has given Ukraine in lethal and non-lethal assistance since 2014? What equipment and training have they given them specifically, and what else should we be giving? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you very much, uh, Melinda, for chairing this. Uh, and I want to thank the Atlanta Council uh, for uh, taking the effort to organize this very important event on a very important topic at a very important time. Uh, before I get into the details on, on what uh, the U.S. has done in terms of support, I just want to quickly uh, point out as a reminder, and I don't, need to tell, I don't need to tell this audience what I'm about to say, but I, I feel obliged to repeat it. We should not forget that it was in 2014, it was Russia that invaded Ukraine and not the other way around, okay? Russia is the aggressor here. Ukraine is the victim. Uh, it, it, was, it is a matter of fact that a chunk of Ukraine that was recognized as the international community as being part of Ukraine is now not under their sovereign control. So that's why we're here today discussing this. That's the most important fact when it comes to Ukraine, is that this is a nation that's at war, uh, fighting for its survival, uh, it, it, Ukraine represents this idea in modern Europe today that sovereign nation states should have the ability to choose uh, how and by whom they are governed and which organizations and alliances they wish to join and no outside country should have a veto on that. So that's how we got to where we are today with Ukraine. In terms of U.S. Uh, support to Ukraine, uh, since 2014, the U.S. has provided, on average, just over $300 million a year in non-lethal uh, military or non-military assistance. And during the same period of time, uh, has uh, granted Ukraine <clears throat> three separate $1 billion lines of credit loans. On the military side, 
the U.S. has provided uh, in terms of lethal and non-lethal military assistance since 2014, about $1.5 billion. And uh, of course, the eye-catching aspect of this are the, the javelins, but there's also more and less sexy but crucial uh, air, uh, capabilities we provided, such as secure communications, uh, UAVs, um, counter battery radars, um, sniper rifles, uh, <laughs> grenade launchers, uh, the, these sort of things. But I, I want to say that um, while th this is all welcome uh, for the Ukrainians, the most important thing the U.S. has provided the Ukrainians by this military assistance has been the symbolic value of America's support. Uh, in fact, there's not a single U.S. javelin on the front line in the Donbass today. But that doesn't matter, because what does matter is the message it's sent to Russia and to our European allies that we're going to provide the Ukrainians the most advanced anti-tank missile system in the world. And if they need to use it, they have it. And we have Ukraine's back. So it's the symbolism. We shouldn't get caught up on the numbers and the capabilities. We have to remember in international affairs, symbolism matters. And that right now for Ukraine is probably the most important thing. Let me ask you a follow-up question. So the javelins were a really big issue for a long time. But have they actually changed the balance of forces beyond the symbolism? No, not right now. Uh, we, we have to remember um, when you fire off a javelin missile, it's essentially shooting up a Porsche in terms of the, the cost for one of these missiles, right? Um, and so these are very precious assets. And right now the front lines in eastern Ukraine are relatively static. Uh, of course, uh, Ukrainian soldiers are dying on a weekly basis. Uh, they are fighting, but there has been no major push, uh, certainly no major armor push uh, to uh, change the, uh, the, the front lines right now. So. I would, I would still stand by my point that this is right now more about symbolism and it should always be remembered that Ukraine does have these missiles and has trained to use these missiles in case they actually ever need them. Thanks, Luke. The first panel talked a lot about NATO and some experts say that NATO can't count on, or I'm sorry, some experts say that Ukraine can't count on NATO membership anytime soon but NATO could still offer EOP status, Enhanced Opportunity Partner status in NATO. Is that a good idea? And what would EOP status signal? Uh, certainly, any time you can advance that NATO-Ukraine uh, relationship, we should, including EOP status. Georgia has EOP status. Australia, um, uh, Jordan does. Uh, so it, you know, these are serious countries, right? And Ukraine is a serious country in Europe. And all things considered, going back to the Bucharest summit, where Ukraine was promised eventual membership into NATO, points to the direction that, yes, uh, EOP should be um, given to Ukraine. But I, don't, I, I feel like sometimes we get too wrapped around the axle on you know, these acronyms and these terms and, and everything. We, we need to um, make sure that the Ukrainian path towards full NATO membership continues in the right direction. And, you know, it might be a long journey, it might be a bumpy journey, but it needs to continue down the right path. And, and one concern I have, not necessarily with EOP, but with some of these other um, initiatives like major non-NATO ally status, for example, I, I understand the appeal of something like this, but um, in terms of major non-NATO ally, the, the clue is in the name. Um, so it might, short term, it might sound great, but in the long term, you know, we don't want a major non-NATO ally with Ukraine. We want a NATO ally with Ukraine. So I think we have to be careful in how we look at these things. Thank you. Glenn, I know you've done a lot of thinking and looking at Ukraine's army and, and Navy. And the Army itself has massively improved over the last five years. A lot of people have noted that. But the Navy remains underdeveloped. What more can the U.S. and Western allies do to shore up Ukraine's Navy? Beyond providing more boats, what kind of equipment and training would you recommend? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing me to come here today, Melinda. And thank you for your excellent job in moderating the panel. I'd also like to thank Ambassador Herbst for thinking of me and inviting me today. Uh, and for the Atlantic Council's leadership in trying to put this event together. Um, it's a great group of people. Um, I think the first thing you need to do uh, when we talk about Ukraine and the Navy is to try to fixate on what is the role uh, in American national interests. 
Now, you have to start, first of all, with history and start in, in, with the uh, annexation of Crimea uh, by Catherine the Great. After that occurred, Russia became a Mediterranean power. Now, why is that? Because Crimea became a, a very much a launching point for the, the Russian, uh, Russian Navy, the Tsarist Navy, and began a challenge in the Mediterranean. Today, there are up to six kilo submarines that are based inside the Black Sea. These submarines are, are moving back and forth through the, uh, through the Bosporus into the Black Sea, uh, from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. Uh, and they, these groups of, of subs are, are uh, trailing American carrier battle groups. Um, so if you begin with the importance of Crimea, then you start to be able to fixate on what are American national interests and why it's a threat. Now, ever since, um, uh, now I, I, because I've talked a lot about and focused on the Navy, you know, it's very key important, you know, many people have always focused on Donbass, but they always get kind of sidetracked uh, and don't understand that even the basic symbol of the Ukrainian flag is a trident. Um, a very large percentage of, of, of Ukraine's littoral is, is uh, facing the Black Sea. Uh, as much as a quarter of the GDP of Odessa depends on sea trade. Uh, so it's a very, very critically important. And then you throw in the Sea of Azov and the agricultural exports, uh, then you put in the context of Mariupol. Now, the long and short of why what has been happening with U.S. policy has been they have in desperate need of trying to get a strategy. And they become, as many of us do, fixated on, on, on objects. Now, you heard Luke talk about the javelins. Well. Uh, we, Ukraine, for various reasons, um, because the Poroshenko administration was very much fixated on building its own indigenous uh, sh uh, gunboats and uh, shipbuilding industry, uh, decided at a late in the game not to try to, uh, to make use of the United States offering of what they call island-class patrol boats. Um, and only late in the game did the, the Poroshenko government uh, decide to go with this, but they finally did at the end of the day. Now, what we've seen is the rival within uh, and great uh, great pressure put on by many groups here in Washington um, was the pressure to try to get Ukraine to get these patrol boats. Why? Because the Gerza gunboats that they have are no nothing but a bunch of uh, uh, boats for your, for your backyard lake. They're not really the type of military weapons that, that one can try to use in a way to deter the Russians. The bottom line is if a quarter of Odessa's GDP or the Ukraine's GDP is coming from Odessa, um, you have no navy. There's no no one other than rotating groups of American uh, Aegis class destroyers and NATO boats, NATO uh, warships coming into the Black Sea uh, and rotating due to the Montreux Convention. So therefore, when they're not in town, uh, Odessa is wide open to the Russian navy. Now, the the problem increasingly now has become very quite desperate. Now, Melinda asked me for a recommendation with the delivery of the uh, the mar of the um, island class patrol boats now in Odessa. It's a great benefit, but the problem is they don't come with weaponry. So the, the key desperate thing that they need now, are hell, what they've been looking at, are Hellfire, uh, naval variant of the Hellfire missiles. And so these are, uh, Hellfire is also uh, located on the Apaches helicopters, but they also, there's a naval variant of that. And if they can give, the, give Ukraine these, uh, the Hellfire missiles, then that would allow Ukraine slowly to be able to build out from Odessa and protect the port and also challenge Russian uh, naval superiority in the Black Sea. Now this is, um, now th I know the discussion is underway, but this is not going to solve the problem immediately. But what is happening all across the seaboard uh, since May 2015, May 15th, 2018, when Putin crossed the Kerch Strait Bridge is that Russia has increasingly applied what they call the boat constrictor strategy of slowly strangling Ukraine's economy. Because whether we like it or not, much of Ukraine's steel exports come, have to be exported by, by sea from Mariupol. Currently, there are wait times since they created the Kerch Strait Bridge and closed it off. The wait times have alternated between 73, uh, 73 hours up to 143 hours for ships waiting for transit through the Kerch Strait. So right, basically, it's, uh, it's basically Ukraine saying, Mother, may I, can I go through the Kerch Straits? And so Russia is using this type of economic strangulation uh, and a type of warfare on Ukraine that's very much impacting Mariupol. If Mariupol cannot cannot keep people employed and cannot produce steel and cannot export it, and it can't go by land. It's too, the steel exports are, are too much to go by, uh, to, by railroad. But if they can't get this, we're facing the, the, the death of Mariupol. Now, I looked at some of the economic statistics recently. Mariupol has lost 9.8% of its cargo turnover in 2018 compared with 2017. 
So far, from January to June of 20 of this year, uh, they've lost 13.8 percent. So slowly, you're starting to see the death of Mariupol. And, if, and as long as this problem occurs, there, it's, going to, and it's going to be increasingly a problem. Now, way, the way militarily you try to do this is through the concept of sea denial capabilities. There's these gun, gears of gunboats that the Ukrainian Navy wants to transport and move to Mariupol and slowly be able to protect the port and be able to slowly edge out its capabilities. But the United States has to develop a, some type of military strategy uh, in the Black Sea that has some thought behind it and, and not one that's focused on Aegis class destroyers and carrier battle groups. Okay? The way the British and the French defeated the Russians in the Crimean War was through the economic strangulation of Sevastopol. That's the long and short of it, and it was done by sea power. Okay? And this is something that historians and military experts often forget, but this is really critical because when you look at the Odessa, and just exclude the fact that we're talking about Mariupol, ex look at Odessa. There's something called floating gas rigs that Russia has appropriated, took, seized from uh, uh, Ukraine when they invaded Crimea in 2014. There's one of these gas rigs that's called the Tavrida gas rig. The gas rig has now 24.5 miles from Ukraine's Serpent Island. Now, why am I pointing this out? Because when you have a gas rig off the coast and the main shipping channel for all of Ukraine's maritime exports through Odessa, have to go through a narrow corridor of 24.5 miles between Serpent Island and the Trevrita gas rig. The gas rig is floating, it's weaponized, it's equipped with all types of air defense weaponry, and this thing keeps drifting out. And what the Russians are doing is what they call creeping annexation. And we're not paying attention to it, but this stuff is starting, and is starting slowly to, to diverge over. And we may wake up one morning, as we did uh, several months ago, when the Russians said, oh, we're going to have live firing exercises in, in the entire Black Sea region. So all commercial traffic in the Black Sea, get out. And whoa, I mean, what do, so you have navies, you have commercial you know, ships, you have all these, all these things occurring and people are asking questions. But you could wake up one morning and the Russians have declared an exclusive economic zone around the Tavrita gas rig, and suddenly uh, Odessa is wide open and everybody's going to be saying, oh, well, freedom of navigation, maybe we should think about that. Well, they thought about it. They thought about it for Kurt Strait, and uh, unfortunately, Admiral Fogo said, no, we're not, the U.S. Navy's not going to get involved. We're not going there. So case closed. Okay, well, okay. And what are we seeing? Mariupol slowly dying. But now you're starting to see the case of this danger between Serpent Island, which is, it used to be part of Romania, and it's now part of uh, Ukraine. Um, it's a piece of rock, but pieces of rock can also, uh, like Gibraltar, can be very strategically significant. Now, why... This is, this, and this is where it requires some type of strategy. And the United States isn't putting its time and effort into that. For example, you have the strategic problem, the Montreux Convention, which restricts U.S. warships being able, in all non-signatory nations, the Montreux Convention, to have access to the Black Sea. They have to rotate in, in and out of, of the region. Uh, it was a 24-day schedule, I believe. And, but the problem here is that the United States needs to start thinking in Ukraine in a trilateral way about security of the Black Sea with Romania. Now, the problem is Romania depends a lot of its uh, trade through the Bosphorus, so it's kind of a little bit touchy about how it deals with Turkey. But the problem is, is through the Danube, you can create and deploy warships, uh, small warships, that could become part of a, a rapid reaction force that could be uh, used to reinforce Odessa because when the way the U.S. Navy operates in the Black Sea is these ships are always in transit in the, Black, in the Mediterranean, but they're always keeping some of these ships uh, ready for deployment outside of the, uh, the Bosporus in the Mediterranean, ready to go into the Black Sea to protect Ukraine if there's a crisis when they're not there. But the problem is, is that it takes time. Okay, and time is a problem in the Black Sea. We don't have 48 hours for wait on these warships sometimes because the Russians can strike any any chance they want into this region. Thanks, now, Glenn. Thanks. That, that that's a terrific answer, and we're definitely going to look for you uh, to in, and watch your writing for the strategy because it sounds like you've done a lot of really good thinking about it. Uh, thank you for mentioning Hellfire missiles. Uh, Luke, you dodged my question before. Uh, he gave a very passionate answer, or a very passionate explanation for why Hellfire missiles uh, should be one of the things that should go on, on the U.S. list. Uh, would you, is there anything else that, in terms of, of equipment and uh, training that you'd want to put on the list? You, you gave us a very full explanation of what we've done so far. 
Yeah, well, I would add um, lifting restrictions on U.S. service personnel operating um, uh, east of the Dnieper River. I think having uh, U.S. military personnel um, not embedded as combatants, but at least as observers, could better inform the debate uh, in the DOD about what the Ukrainians actually need on the front lines. And right now, U.S. troops won't go anywhere, can't go anywhere near the front lines. And this is the same for the defense of Mariupol, I would say. I agree 110% with Glenn. And I think that when the three ships were apprehended, um, well, almost a year ago to the date, in fact, um, the, the response from the U.S. was very lackluster. I would have had the commander of 6th Fleet in Mariupol observing the situation, seeing what's going on to get an idea on what the U.S. needs to do to help Ukraine improve their maritime capabilities. So for sure, we often focus about the land component, but there are uh, maritime domain awareness uh, uh, capabilities that we should be helping Ukraine with. NATO should be doing this. So for example, NATO has these trust funds that were created at the Wales Summit um, that focus on different capabilities for Ukraine. And I think it's time to hit the refresh button on some of these. They're underfunded. One of these trust funds is a counter IED capability trust fund for the Ukrainians. When's the last time Ukrainian soldiers have been hit by an IED? I mean, perhaps it's happened, but I don't think it happens all that often where they need a, a trust fund for this. But yet there's no trust fund for maritime domain awareness. Uh, so I think we need to has, take a step back and reevaluate five years on from the invasion what Ukraine needs right now, not what they needed in 2014. That's a great point. Thank you so much. So uh, Paul, Alina, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. On December 9th is a really big deal. It's a really big date for Ukraine. All eyes are going to be fixated on Paris when the presidents of Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany meet and try to find a way out of the war that Russia started. It's become a truism that everything depends on Moscow. What do the Russians want? What do the Ukrainians want? And what could Ukraine and the, the international community offer to incentivize them to finally get out of the Donbass? I'll start with Paul, then turn to Alina. Um, well, first of all, I think um, uh, this meeting is a win for the Russians. Um, the Russians have long wanted respect. They've sort of been uh, ostracized from from the world, from the from the Western world, um, uh, and a big meeting uh, like this shows that that Putin can still be influential, not totally isolated, um, and the sheer fact that it's happening uh, is good for the Russians. Um, uh, now, the Russians certainly would like to have sort of, you know, they want the Ukrainians to give in to sort of recognize the self-proclaimed uh, entities as as legal entities, to sort of bring them back in into a federalized system uh, that would give Moscow a lot of clout. Um, um, but if it doesn't get that, I think uh, Moscow is perfectly happy with the status quo uh, the way it is. It can ratchet it up, it can ratchet it down. Um, I think Moscow is still uh, trying to size up Zelensky and sort of figure out uh, you know, where he is and where he stands and how much leeway he has from the Ukrainian population. And he seems to sort of want to be sort of a peace builder and sort of de-escalate. Um, but but you know what is the uh, what is the notion? Um, and then finally, you know I think, you know I don't expect a whole lot. Um, I think we've been through this before, um, uh, and I think we've seen um, these European leaders, you know, try to do this without great great results. Um, but I just want to sort of uh, underscore that for Russia, I think you know a Ukraine that's struggling with its security means that it's struggling with its political reform. It's struggling with its economic uh, uh, reform. Um, and Russia really doesn't want um, a Ukraine that is you know, a successfully democratic, functioning Ukraine um, for multiple reasons, most of which is it's an alternate model for the region uh, overall. Um, and um, if there is a successful democratic change, we've already seen a democratic you know, uh, shift in power, which is tremendous. Um, uh, um, you know, in, in other parts of the world where everybody's voicing their concerns through the street, here we have uh, a tremendous uh, positive result uh, through the ballot box. Um, so I think um, uh, if, if they can't get exactly what they want, um, uh, as long as they can get the status quo and be able to keep on turning that pressure on Ukraine um, and complicate its reform effort, uh, the Russians would be quite happy. Great. Thank you. Aline? Um, yeah, thanks so much, Melinda, and again, thanks to the Atlantic Council for um, organizing all of us uh, here today. Um, since you mentioned the December 9th meeting, um, this is the first meeting of this Normandy format uh, negotiations around the Minsk agreements, the first meeting, uh, I believe, since three years ago is going to be taking place. 
Um, and I think one thing that's different now than was three years ago is the U.S. was never officially at the table because of the Normandy format. Uh, but this year, um, and this, I think, pretty important meeting, uh, because the first one in, in over three years, we're really not going to be at the table. And I think it's critical that the United States continues to be engaged, not in an official way, but as we have been in the past through these informal channels that the Obama administration established, the Trump administration also had, um, to continue to work um, our European with our European allies to make sure that this doesn't play into the Kremlin's interests. And my concern now is that if the U.S. is in fact absent from those negotiations in an informal capacity, uh, that we may not end up in, in a good place. Um, I think uh, Zelensky has pushed multiple times for better, for closer U.S. engagement. He's also pushed for the U.K. to take a more active role at some points. And in a recent interview, he also clarified kind of what they're looking for, meaning they're not looking to hold elections um, in the so-called LNR, DNR, uh, while there are still Russian forces on the ground, while there's still weapons on the ground. Uh, but it seems unclear that why Moscow would want to remove those weapons and remove those forces. Uh, the Moscow strategy is let's hold elections now, which would be akin to the Crimea referendum, quote unquote referendum, um, and then we give the special status uh, to those regions uh, without any changes um, on the Russian side. And I think this is, of course, untenable and um, very, very uh, problematic for the Ukrainians, but they seem to want to move towards the Minsk sequencing. And that Minsk sequencing is really beneficial to Russia and really detrimental to Ukrainian interests. So I guess my hope for December 9th is that nothing happens. Because <laughs> that, be that would be probably the best outcome for Ukraine, even though that's not a great outcome. And the whole um, is better than moving closer and closer towards the Russian position. I think that's a lot of our hope. Alina, uh, uh, just to push you a little bit, what options does Ukraine have? Is, is, the, is the best option just freezing the conflict and, and waiting it out? Well, this is such a touchy issue in Ukraine. There have been a series of protests in Kiev um, ahead of these meetings because the concern that some have in Ukraine is that Zelensky, in his desire to have peace, I mean, if he ran on any platform, that was his platform. It was no more war, I'm a peacemaker, and no more corruption, right, uh, without a lot of details. We're getting more details on that now, but I think the concern is that in his desire for a deal of some kind, um, that he will take steps that will actually be quite unpopular uh, among most Ukrainians. And there is a movement now to organize a series of protests right before December 9th um, in Ukraine to really signal that the population will not be behind him if he moves too close to fulfilling some of the Russian goals in the negotiation process. And so I think the reality is that there is no good outcome for Ukraine unless the Russians change their calculus and do something. And they're very unlikely to do that. Um, so I think the problem that we face is that, of course, the majority of Ukrainians uh, don't want to see those territories be completely cut off um, and to be these unstable gray zones on Ukrainian territory. Um, yet, it's not clear what the next steps would be. So I think we're going to be stuck with the status quo for a very long time, unless there's a change from the Russian side. Thank you. Well, one other question. You're a, you're a Europeanist by training, and so I'd like to ask you about uh, the thinking of the French and the Germans. We understand why Zelensky is eager to sit down in Paris, but why are the French and Germans so eager now? I'm glad you asked that. I, I wanted to make one comment. Uh, we were talking a lot about why Ukraine is so important for U.S. interests, but of course Ukraine is far more important for European interests. Um, Ukraine is a European country. It is on the border with uh, EU members. It is the frontline state. Um, and the EU has done quite a bit to support uh, Ukrainian economic reforms um, and various other kinds of reforms. Um, and I think we forget that, that this is not just a U.S. priority, it's a transatlantic priority. Um, in terms of funding, uh, the EU as a whole has provided at least 15 billion in funding since 2014. That's a huge amount. And that doesn't take into account a lot of other programs and things on the ground that various EU member states in the EU has been funding in Ukraine. I just think it's important to remember that, that this is not just the US priority, it's a transatlantic priority. Um, but I have my doubts about the current environment in France and especially some of the comments that the president of France, President Macron, has been making. And again, this is why U.S. presence 
at the negotiating table is so critical because we've seen Macron, one, we all have heard the uh, NATO uh, brain death comment, uh, but that comment is, didn't happen in isolation. That comment is part of the strategic uh, shift or pivot towards a close relationship with Russia, um, which Macron himself has described as rebuilding some or rethinking some sort of new security architecture for Europe that includes Russia, while at the same time the EU is sanctioning Russia, while at the same time Russia has invaded European countries, not EU member states, but European countries, and continues to launch various kinds of information cyber warfare against EU member states, including his own campaign back in 2017. And so I'm really, really concerned about Macron's presence and his administration's presence at the negotiating table on December 9th, which is again why I said the best outcome will be no outcome. Um, I think the problem we face in the French-German dynamic is given the state of politics in Germany, Germany has taken a back seat to decision making at the European level. And that has left uh, the way completely open for Macron's um, temper tantrums uh, when it comes to NATO and then when it comes to the broader European security architecture. And I'm really, really concerned about these overtures to the Kremlin. Um, I don't know what he has in mind or why this has become part of um, the, the new strategy. Uh, it seems like the Elysee has been completely disconnected from the diplomatic core on this. Um, but I'm really concerned about it. And I think Macron is doubling down on it, and that's really problematic. Where is it coming from, though? Is it business interests that are shaping his opinion? Uh, who's, who's, uh, how do you understand great it? Question. Um, it's a great question to ask uh, some of our French analysts who are not here. Um, who may have a, uh, a more um, insightful view into this. Uh, but my conversations with people, because I've been trying to figure out this question as well, you know, what is driving this? And the answer seems to be that it's um, driven by one Macron's frustration that he can't be the president of Europe, that he's the president of France, um, and that he has been uh, incapable of building the kind of coalition you need to push through your vision for Europe. Uh, because the Germans haven't been behind him, even though initially it seemed like there was this great relationship with Macron and Merkel um, that hasn't really panned out in terms of policy. Um, and I think he sees himself, you know, in this very French way, as sort of the, the neo-Gaulist tra tradition, um, as a great power that's at the table, sounds familiar, um, you know, making deals with other great powers about the future of geopolitical order, and Russia's a great power. And there's no, clear economic reason, uh, given Russia's economic state, which is absolutely detrimental and in deep decline, for a country like France to have a more strategic economic relationship with Russia, which of course Macron has gone back to multiple times. Um, and I think what's driving it is probably a lot of ego um, and probably a lot of frustration with the decision-making process in Europe, uh, where Macron sees himself as uh, being the president of the continent but in fact, he's not. And I think that's probably a very frustrating experience for him. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Alina. Uh, Paul, you wanted to hop yeah, in here. I, I do think, I mean, I, you know, I think I, I can never dismiss, um, you know, business interests, because I think, you know, particularly some French and, and Russian business interests are always, uh, are, are, are always there and always knocking on the door as they are throughout Europe. So I, I, I wouldn't totally um, uh, dismiss that. Um, I would very much agree um, with your comments about him being frustrated and frustrated. I think there's a lot of frustration within sort of the NATO alliance in general and sort of he's sort of seeing his role as perhaps, you know, leading a more a robust Europe, whether or not that will, will, will come um, is, is difficult to say. Um, I also sort of see, you know, this kind of suits um, uh, Russia perfectly well, uh, because Russia is keen to stoke problems within the NATO alliance. It's keen to stoke problems within the European Union. Um, and we know that um, uh, in NATO countries on the eastern flank are very unhappy with this initiative. NATO countries on the other side of the Atlantic are not very happy with this interest, with this initiative. Um, so I think it, you know, it, it just causes problems broadly within the Euro-Atlantic community that doesn't, um, you know, that, that, that he might not be fully thinking, uh, thinking of and just adds to some of the tensions that we already have um, uh, in, in NATO. Um, I would also agree, I mean, the French have had a long history of trying to sort of be the negotiator between Russia and the West. Uh, you look back at Sarkozy in 2008. Didn't go too well um, back in 2008. Um, and I see sort of a lot of a, rep you know, repetition um, of that. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, Macron to me seems like he thinks he can deal with Putin. 
um, but I'm not quite sure. Um, Putin has been through, I think he's uh, the fourth French president Putin has dealt with. I think Macron was probably still in college when Putin came <laughs> to power. Um, uh, and then you just look at the international leaders. I mean, he's been there. He's been through you know, four French presidents, four US presidents, five uh, British prime ministers. So Putin knows how to sort of deal with these people. Um, and I think um, having a much more co coherent, unified Western approach um, would really be uh, quite helpful as we move into this. And I don't see that happening yet. Uh, that I forgot to you have more to say about the French? Oh my goodness. Uh, Go I will just say that the, there is a domestic political component here. The French right, uh, which Macron constantly has to straddle, has always been, cause, because Paul mentioned Sarkozy, has always had this pro-Russian or soft Russian kind of uh, tilt to it. And I think a lot of what Macron is doing now is also playing into that. Um, on top of that, we've also had the French veto over uh, fu future accession talks. Um, with regards to Albania and North Macedonia um, for the EU. And that has also now been part of this broader rethinking, strategic rethinking that's coming, I think, directly from the Elysee. Um, and I think that kind of skepticism about continued EU enlargement is not unwarranted. But when you take all of these things together, meaning uh, the NATO comments, uh, the pro-Russia comments, the veto on um, accession talks uh, with the Balkans, um, it's, it's starting to look um, deeply, deeply um, kind of isolationist uh, for France, meaning that I do think it's isolating France within the EU. And as Paul absolutely correctly said, that very much serves the Russian interest of further driving wedges, especially between France and Germany. Great. Thank you, Alina. Uh, did you have a comment on France? Because I want to go back to Ukraine. Okay, well, no, no. I mean, no? who could stop on the French? No, I, I just want to, I was going to make those two very points about the domestic politics in France and how, you know, I think a lot of us several years ago were looking very concerned that Marie Le Pen would win, that Macron comes in, sort of breathes life into, into French politics. Um, and I think he still is that bulwark. Um, and lest we forget, too, he's also been one of the few leaders who's really talked out about democracy, um, whether the French words match the actions. Um, that's a different story. And I 100% believe that the French government and Macron very much understand exactly who Putin is and what he has done. And so um, there's a lot of domestic politics. There's a lot of, um, of transatlantic challenges. And I think that, that that is feeding into this situation where you have a disjointed EU um, and a disjointed transatlantic relationship, which is impacting this. I would just say on the NATO front, if you look at the NATO summit declaration, for those people who are worried about it, and of course the French had a sign off on that, the door is still open, um, and that was part of the initial uh, sec I think it's within like the first paragraph of the London uh, summit declaration. So I think the French, despite some of these things, are still there, still in NATO, um, and still supporting the expansion of NATO in countries like North Macedonia. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. OK, we're going to take a break now for Senator Johnson. Please help me welcome him. Talk loud enough, but this is, you get to hear me even louder. Um, because I haven't been part of this, this may be a little disjointed, but, but let me try and tell you why, first of all, I think Ukraine is important. Um, my own background, you know, I'd never been, traveled the world before I ever got in the United States Senate, but I'd never been to Ukraine. So uh, literally it was over Easter in 2011, first congressional delegation I ever went on, uh, visited Georgia, Ukraine, and then the Baltic states. And at that point in time, the, the issues were all about corruption. I think uh, T Timoshenko had been you know, released from jail. Uh, the, 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 whole, the whole issue was uh, corruption in terms of the wheat markets uh, within the press. And it, you just taking a look at you know, all those ring nations, you know, the, the belt uh, between Soviet Union, former Soviet Union and Russia, 
and now Western democracies, uh, really the front lines. And all those nations were certainly trying to shed themselves the legacy of corruption, trying to govern properly, follow the rule of law, uh, create the kind of prosperity their nations had the capability of providing for their, their populations. When you take a look at Ukraine, it should be the breadbasket of Europe. It should be incredibly prosperous. But I mean, that's the same story across so many different countries of the world, but for decent government, but for the rule of law, but for the respect for individual rights and liberty and, and a free market system that allows people to aspire and create and build, uh, it doesn't happen. So as a private sector guy, you know, I, I take a look at that and I go, oh, there's so much potential there. And we want to support them. Fast forward to the events on the Maidan, which is extraordinary what happened. And my own interpretation is you had a group of individuals, obviously, that recognized the future, the economic future, obviously lied in the West. You know, Russia offers nothing, and this is a consistent theme whenever I'm, whenever I'm in Europe. Russia offers your populations nothing other than destabilization, disruption. Your economic futures lie with the West. Again, democracy, freedom, a free market system. So you had a group of, of Ukrainians that, that obviously wanted to integrate more with the West. And of course, Putin's puppet wanted nothing to do that. Obviously, Putin didn't want that. But what created the Maidan, again, this is my telling of the story, is then the young people who, who were tired of the lack of prosperity. I mean, you've got social media now around the world. People look, well, look at what that country, look at what those people have. Why can't we have it? You see that playing out in so many areas of the world, probably more than, you know, right now, Iran, for example. So you had young people who wanted what we believe is an unalienable right granted by our creator. They wanted that for themselves. And so they joined, they combined with the more political part of that, and you end up with the extraordinary events on the Maidan. Uh, I unfortunately did not go with John McCain. Senator Murphy did, and, and we're actually on the Maidan with hundreds of thousands of people at night in the cold, feeling that pulse of the desire for freedom and liberty. I was there a few months later when we walked the Maidan after the slaughter, seeing the memorial, seeing the bullet holes in the, in the lampposts. And so to me, Ukraine is important first and foremost because it's a modern day birthing of a nation. I know, I know Ukraine is old, but the new Ukraine is new and it's a country that is trying to shed itself of the, of the corrupt legacy of the Soviet Union. It, it is a country where the people are yearning to breathe free and, and to take advantage of what prosperity their land and their nation and their economy can really provide. And I think Americans want to support that. It's, it's 240 years later than our own birthing, but we've gone through that. We're still going through it. What are the words of the Constitution? To form a more perfect union. We're far, away, we're far away from that. The division of this country is incredibly unfortunate. But we're still struggling. Freedom is not easy. It's hard. So ju just as a freedom-loving human being, I have a great deal of empathy and sympathy for the citizens, the, the people of Ukraine, that delivered an unbelievable mandate to President Zelensky, who believes the real deal complete political neophyte, as I am, as was President Trump. We have an affinity toward that, recognizing the long knives come out very quickly, and there's very difficult to find anybody you can trust within the political environment. So here you have a young man who has made the statement, he, he, he realized this, this election was not about me, this election was about the people of Ukraine, this election was about what they desire, a corrupt, free, or certainly a less corrupt nation. And he understands that mandate. So to me, Ukraine's important just because of that. I sympathize with freedom-loving people just wanting what everybody in the world basically wants. Safety, security, some measure of prosperity, the ability to raise your family in hopefully a better country in what, than what you grew up in. Isn't that what everybody aspires to? And it's really, from my standpoint, what America represents. 
Yes, we have a strong military and we sometimes need to project that power, but what we primarily need to project is the idea and promise of America. What this country writes, I, I, represents, I always talk about the vision statement in our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that these are God, our creator granted rights. That's what we need to project. That's why Ukraine is important. Now you throw into that mix the fact that it just happens to be the ground zero in our political competi or competition with a thoroughly corrupt regime that is Russia under Putin. And we can't allow Russia to become more and more aggressive. And Putin is incredibly opportunistic. And if we don't help Ukraine, who's going to? So. Uh, So, so that, that's my primary me message. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, that this this debate has, in, in some respects, with what President Trump's concern about providing the military aid, which, by the way, he provided the Javelin missiles, they were in place, they deterred further aggression. Uh, I certainly think it's very unfortunate this debate blew up into the public, where the sausage-making process, in this case, of foreign policy, was fully exposed. It didn't have to be. It's not helpful. There's a lot of damage being done to our democracy right now because of this exposure. President Trump felt he had to release the transcripts. What world leader is going to feel comfortable being candid with any future American president? We are weakening executive privilege. I know I'm a member of the Senate, but I have a great deal of respect for the executive branch and the ability for a chief executive, the President of the United States, to get candid advice from his advisors as well. We need to understand the damage is being done to our democracy in this process as well. We were well on our path to completing that sausage making process. If not within the executive branch, and by the way, when I was in Ukraine with Senator Murphy on, on September 5th, the first thing that President Zelensky asked us is, okay, let's put it, put, put, set aside the, the diplomatic talk here, what's happening with the aid? Because I just spoken to the President, I laid out what the issues were. I was unsuccessful at getting President Trump to give me the authority to say the, the, the hold has been released. But it, it was about corruption. And it was about lack of or insufficient support from the Europeans. That, those are the reasons. But I, in that same meeting, I said, let's be unified. Let's not blow this out of proportion. Let's not make this a big deal. The truth of the matter is there are deficit hawks in the administration. I know them. They're looking at the end of the fiscal year, this money hasn't been spent. There's all kinds of money that hasn't been spent. What can we save? If, if President Trump doesn't release the hold, no big deal. Senator Murphy's on appropriations. You know, Congress will, re, re, will remedy this. A few weeks from now, we'll appropriate the money and not give the executive any option whatsoever. So within the, within the executive branch, between the, the two branches of government, this sausage making process is being resolved. It ended up being resolved on September 11th, okay? Now, again, I know there's all kinds of controversy. There's all kinds of, you know, the worst possible construction put on everything said. But coming from a business background, I was in manufacturing. You're solving problems all the time. The first question I'd always ask myself when I confronted a new challenge, a new problem, was, is there an opportunity in this? Can something good come out of something bad? Generally, there is. And I would say in this case, and I'll conclude my remarks, remarks on this point. In this case, although this has not been good, in this case, we can utilize this to convey to the Ukrainian people, first of all, congressional support. I think they, they realize almost universally within the administration, the administration's support and hopefully the American people support for the courageous people of Ukraine that stood up against Vladimir Putin and his puppet and yearned to be free and more than 100 of them lost their lives in that courageous effort. And as Americans, we should support that time and time and time again, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Iran, whether it's in Hong Kong. That's who we are, we're a compassionate nation, that's how we provide the kind of leadership that I think this world is craving for. Thank you much.
that was well put that the pulse for freedom and liberty is still alive and well, and the fight is still on in Ukraine. And that's a perfect transition to the domestic picture. We're going to move from Paris to Kiev, Ukraine. So uh, we've heard uh, Senator Murphy and Senator Johnson have both said uh, Vladimir Zelensky is the real deal. I'd like to ask Jonathan and Alina, I want to turn to Jonathan first. Jonathan, do you agree with this assessment? What do you make of him so far? So we've talked about the platform he was elected on, and he talks a big game uh, on corruption. Uh, but he also has done some weird things that aren't necessarily in line uh, with his talk. He appointed Andrei Bogdan as his chief of staff, and he keeps playing footsie with Ihor Kolomoisky. At the same time, he has done good things. Activists praise his appointment of Prosecutor General Ruslan Rybashovka. How do you understand these contradictions in Zelensky? Well, I, I think you, um, I think you, early on, you mentioned that the the Rada in particular. And let's 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 step back. President Zelensky was elected last spring. A new Rada was elected this summer. Took office in September, so we're about three months into um, into a new Rada, really a new government, and. Uh, and I think they came out very quickly, passing a number of reforms, some that were um, you know, widely praised, including the, the lifting of parliamentary immunity, which still needs to go through um, the legislative process. And I think for many people, yeah, there's a lot of hope in President Zelensky, but more so if you're looking at the polling numbers, um, when you look at how the Ukrainian public views what's taking place, and almost in an unprecedented way in terms of support, so President Zelensky, his promises were both on anti-corruption. He also made a promise on the Donbass. And I think part of the conversation that we're having here uh, about the Donbass is also about his wanting to ensure that he follows through politically on that, on, on, on that uh, promise. But also, I think an understanding now, I think even with the protests that were mentioned, that it's a more challenging issue to resolve domestically, politically. And let's not forget um, that similar type of pressure was uh, put on uh, Mr. Poroshenko as well. And as we all recall, there was a deadly uh, incident in front of the Rada where people were killed. There was a grenade attack. Um, it's, it has been, it's a very difficult domestic political issue, rife with a number of challenges politically amongst different groups. Um, and one of the things I, I admire, which we're, we, we really haven't focused on today, is, is President Zelensky's efforts in the Donbass, not on necessarily just the resolution, of the conflict, but really reaching out uh, to those in the government-controlled, non-government-controlled areas, uh, opening up new bridges, uh, creating people-to-people -people contact, uh, which means that even if there's not a deal now, and I associate with Elena, I'm hoping in this case um, a bad deal, you know, is 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 not acceptable. Um, hopefully, the U.S. and others will be standing with the Ukrainians um, in in the strongest possible way to ensure that a bad deal doesn't happen. But I think what he's doing is laying, I think, a very important ground uh, groundwork and laying the groundwork for engagement between those who are on both sides of the Donbass, getting down to the people to people. And I think that's something that, that's been seen. There was a great economic uh, conference held in Mariupol to raise concerns about what's happening there. And, you know, It doesn't replace the ability to conduct the type of trade they should because of blocked or clogged or waterways that Russia won't let uh, Ukrainians do uh, uh, their transportation or economy or trade through. But it's really important, and I think we should be praised for that. So he gets high, high marks right now for doing that. I think the areas where we, there are some concerns of what you laid out, which is who is he bringing, who is he surrounding himself with? And I think we're all aware of one really sort of major elephant in the room, which is Privat Bank his relationship with uh, Mr. Kolomoisky, an oligarch. You mentioned, I think earlier, someone mentioned earlier, when you start to look at the list of things that have an impact on the Ukrainian leader, and, and this is not the first go around. I see Ambassador Herbst, you've been through various leaderships that promise reforms, but then get caught up in the same, uh, same process again, where you have invested uh, political and economic interests that have uh, ended up, uh, even in the most promising of circumstances, whether it's the Orange Revolution or post-Maidan. And so with Mr. Zelensky, this is a real opportunity. Now, the question is wh whether or not oligarchs will, you know, that are still out there, that haven't left, that claim that they will reclaim Privat Bank again, like Mr. Kolymoisky, will win the day. And I think that's the, that's the $10 million question. It's the question that the IMF 
has been uh, discussing with him. It's disconcerting to see the attacks on those of the National Bank of Ukraine. It's unacceptable. Uh, they need to have protection. Those who are responsible should be brought to justice. Um, and it's quite clear who is responsible and behind these attacks. And so Mrs. Zelensky, I think even over the next couple of weeks, fulfilling all the reform legislation that exists, not just in the first passage of the law, but in the second passage as well, is gonna be critical. He is taking the right steps in a number of areas, but the proof will be not only in the passage of the laws, but the implementation. And I have seen, just as somebody who oversaw um, USAID projects back during the Obama administration, we saw many great laws passed, um, but they were not implemented. New anti-corruption bodies stood up, but were blocked from being able to carry out their duty. Um, and it's not lost, and I think it was Senator Johnson who mentioned uh, seeing the bullet holes in the Maidan. Uh, the lack of prosecution of those responsible for the deaths of those during the Maidan um, is reprehensible, and that needs to be addressed. Or the attacks on civil society where nobody's been brought to justice, unacceptable. So there's a lot of important things that, that this government, um, I'm a glass half full with Mr. Zelensky, but this is, the reforms are not short term. These are all, this is a long term effort. And just so I, I wanna add this, and I don't wanna <laughs> monopolize, the American component to this, and what you've done today, and I wanna thank you for hosting and Atlanta Council for leading and all, everybody who's participated, all the think tanks, I think it really shows the strong support for Ukraine and Washington. And I think there would probably be many more organizations who would have loved to place their, their names in support of this. But the US support is really critical. I'm happy to hear that the senator, the senator mentioned that. Um, maintaining the funding and assistance levels for Ukraine is incredibly important. Not just a one year funding level, but multi-years. This will be a multi-year process. And so doing that, the US is, is the second largest provider of assistance in Ukraine, maintaining those levels are important. And that's why you know, that joint, that bipartisan support, congressional support has been critical, um, especially if you have executive branch that may seek to cut assistance, not just based on sort of the political moment of Ukraine, but more so on, on the issue we don't believe in foreign assistance. Let's go, that's a, a, a deeper issue. But I do think that for Ukraine, and I, I, I wanna just sort of add this, the US example um, of rule of law of democracy, of respect for that is critical. And having the ability to engage the Ukrainians um, in a, a voice that backs up what we say is important. And so I only think that as we have a process in Washington right now, some may agree, some may disagree, it's so important to actually show Ukrainians and the world that we do have a process that upholds the rule of law regardless of political party or who's in charge. And I think if we lead by example, because we are not perfect as a, as a nation, I think that's really important. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. In Zelensky's latest interview uh, in Time Magazine, he mentioned that US support for Ukraine is just incredibly important, exactly how you said it, uh, because it affects everyone else. So I think that's a really important point. Alina, what's your take on, on Zelensky? Is Jonathan right? Are the senators right? Or do you see other, uh, something else? Uh, no, I mean, I tend to agree with what Jonathan uh, laid out. Um, you know, he is still very much an unknown, I think, in his own thinking view of the world, but we're learning much more about that, not just in his public um, commentary and the interviews that he's doing, but um, I really found it refreshing that at one point he did this very informal uh, you know, uh, marathon with journalists at a cafe in, in Kiev, and they could just come and ask him questions directly, and I think that was unprecedented. I mean, you can't really imagine, obviously, any world leader, uh, the president of a country doing that. Hold on a second. That, that's impressive, but he also refuses to talk to, talk to the press and only gives interviews, interviews sure. uh, to people he knows and uh, gives pre-canned Facebook uh, interviews. That's not real press freedom. Well, I'll let you, you I, I, this was not a commentary on <laughs> press freedom. It was more a commentary on his personality. Sure, sure that I can't imagine any other president doing that. Sure. And we can debate whether he's actually answering the questions or evading them like many most politicians do, um, you know, and to what extent he's actually out there and, and having the hard debates. Uh, he isn't in the way that he could be, uh, but I still think it is a reflection of how he thinks about um, himself in this role. And it's very different than we've seen Absolutely. before in Ukraine. Um, and that, that was a 
a point that I was trying to make. I think, on, on the other hand, um, you know, we've seen this huge flurry of activity that you mentioned from the RADA, um, and, and Jonathan talked extensively about that, but I think right now Ukraine has the opportunity to really set itself to be on this path to becoming the model country for post-Soviet transition, right? Um, we post the, the era of the Soviet Union ended a long time ago, um, especially in Ukraine in 1991, but we haven't had a gener generational shift until now. I mean, I think we forget that. He is the first leader who doesn't come from the old guard, right? And we kind of had the old guard going back and forth for the entirety of Ukraine's independence. So I think this is such an opportunity for Ukraine. And I think he embodies that opportunity. And he will make mistakes, and he has made mistakes. And not everything the Rada has done has been great, as you all know. Uh, but they have passed this large anti-corruption package um, that tries to relaunch some of the institutions um, that had kind of gone dormant or were paralyzed and highly politicized and blocked from doing their job on investigating and pursuing cases of uh, high level and political corruption. So the privatization of state industry, this is huge. It's huge. Um, and the RADA has passed this. And we'll see what happens on land reform, but that would be a huge thing um, as well that no other Ukrainian government has been able to get through. Um, so I think Ukraine has an opportunity to emerge as a model of what a successful post-Soviet transition can look like and get out of this hole that it's in in terms of being the poorest country in Europe. I will just mention that um, you know, Senator Johnson's comments were right on, except that Ukraine is unique um, in terms of its transition to democracy because of the Russian invasion, right? Because it has an active war. I mean, so does Georgia, but we can't really say that about a huge number of countries across the world. And that is uh, stifling and stymieing its ability to develop and grow for obvious reasons. Um, I think lastly, I will just say to follow on Jonathan's comment on the bipartisan support for Ukraine and the fact that we have all of these um, institutions represented here and we've had such great bipartisan participation from members of Congress. Um, but I think that needs to be followed up with some action. Like it's great to have these conversations, but I would really like to see a bipartisan a statement renewing the commitment to stand with Ukraine, right? At this critical mo moment, I think that will send a really strong message that despite our politics, the policy is still um, going in the right direction, right? And since we are in Congress, um, I hope that's a message that uh, those of you who may be staff uh, can relay um, to your bosses um, and think through because that would send the clearest symbolic message. Um, you know, as uh, I think Luke said earlier, symbolism really matters in the world of international relations. And that would be a very, very powerful symbol um, to get through um, Congress today. Fantastic. Thanks, Alina. I think there's interest in that, and we will definitely uh, be in touch with all the, the various think tanks uh, to put something very robust together, and we'll look for your leadership as well. Uh, Jonathan, uh, another question for you. You went to uh, judicial reform. Let's dig in a little bit there. Everyone knows, it doesn't matter who you talk to, that courts are the most important reform uh, that affects FDI. It affects uh, it basically, it affects the, the economic picture. Uh, it, it affects whether people want to stay in Ukraine or leave. That's a brain drain is another uh, big issue in C Ukraine as well. Now, Zelensky has just passed a new ju judicial bill that and a package of anti-corruption reforms that Alina mentioned. How good are they? Well, these reforms, if they're implemented, I take your point, if they're implemented, finally assure investors that their money is safe and deliver impartial justice. Yeah, I, I think these are all really uh, important steps forward. And if you're an investor, I think maybe some of the things that you're most worried about is that is the is the implementation uh, implementation part of this too, and whether or not um, you, you're going to want to see um, courts reform courts. You're going to want to see uh, the type of judicial reform in the sense of who are the judges. Um, if you're looking at laws, whether or not the prosecutors are able to prosecute uh, in an economic case that your money that you're investing in Ukraine is safe. And so if I was an investor, Ukraine is incredibly promising. I think if somebody mentioned with both human resources, um, natural resources as well, uh, but you're still concerned about whether or not the reforms that are being passed. So, like if we're you know for using football analogies, we're getting you know 20 yard line. You've got a lot of ways to go, and 
I know that, uh, for example, Georgia is a good example of a country that has spent a lot of time looking at the World Bank ease of doing business and addressing the different uh, the different uh, criteria in that, and then moving significantly down, in fact, as a space for countries to do business in. And I know that is part of what the Ukrainian government is looking to do right now. But you still see, in certain areas like agriculture, you st still see vested interests pushing back. The thing I'm more concerned about goes back to pre-bank, which is even if you are critical of, of Poroshenko, uh, one thing in his government, one thing that they worked to do was to address uh, the challenges in the banking sector um, and what the corruption and sort of basically either, you know, t they either took over certain banks or those that were sort of ended. And I think the stability in the banking sector is particularly important for Ukraine. It was a success, and that's why I brought up Privat, Privat Bank, which is, you know, some thought or idea that Mr. Kolomoisky would then return as the, the owner of Privat Bank after, one, using it for his own interest, two, bilking, uh, Ukrainians out of billions of dollars um, and then to receive it back after that bank was bailed out by international partners on top of that to me is the ultimate in chutzpah which I know Mr. Kolomoisky knows about um, and so I would just I would just hope that that um, that you know that when we start thinking about judicial reform we also look at sectoral reforms energy sector reforms agriculture as well and just to make certain that, that the United States and international partners, even if as distracted as they are, are really holding these conditionalities um, to bear uh, when it comes to these things. Because Ukraine's economy is still fragile. Uh, and we all remember what it was like in 2014 for those of us who worked on the macroeconomic account of engagement with Ukraine. The economy was on the verge of collapse. The international community came in. Um, and there were certain conditionality that Ukraine had to fulfill, and one of them was to address the, uh, the banking sector, the problems in the banking sector, to fix those. And so any hint of that going in the wrong direction is it gonna be a bad signal to investors and to Ukraine's international partners, and it, could, it has an impact not only just economically, but on your Atlantic track as well, because it's the fundamental of upholding rule of law and it will be, I think, the quintessential issue for Mr. Zelensky, who has a relationship with Mr. Kolomoisky, uh, if he remains strong on this. And I think if he's truly a, a servant of the people, then he'll hold firm. Okay. All of that's true, Jonathan, but is Zelensky going to cut a deal with Kolomoisky over Privat Bank? <laughs> how, how, do, how, does he, how does he get out of this? Um, he yeah, he holds, holds firm. He holds firm. Um, I think his, his international partners are saying, don't do this. I think it's quite clear what he has to do. And I remember the hemming and hawing, too, of what took place in the previous government on Privat Bank, too. It took a lot of effort to get Ukraine to where it is. That's why a distracted United States, a distracted EU, a distracted partners of Ukraine um, is not good because right now the pressure needs to be there at the highest level of the U.S. government on the gov on on Zelensky not to do this, but there also has to be support and return. And the things that worry me is Zelensky saying, "I don't trust anybody yeah. in the international community. I don't I trust the United States. I don't trust the French. I don't trust, you know." So we need to we need to work at rebuilding that trust with him as well. Uh, but but part of that will be how do we support the economic growth going forward? There's a number of different ways the U.S. can do that. Um, whether new macroeconomic support would be needed as part of a, of, of a IMF package, uh, whether we're talking about trade, enhancing trade and cooperation through various means. The U.S. has other tools, and we should be looking at those tools, even as we're looking at sort of these ideas of how to support Ukraine. I would go further than a resolution. I do think that another type of Ukraine Support Act, uh, building on the initial, taking the initial um, uh, you know, funding levels that, that are there, taking into account all the progress that's been made in various sectors, and retooling it to a Ukraine in 2019, 2020, versus to what Ukraine uh, looked like in 2014. 
Jonathan, I, I, I take your point. Uh, I think it's harder, it's easier said than done. And if, if Zelensky says to hell with Kolomoisky, he's going to get blasted. Uh, and we got local elections coming up. I mean, I think you're right fundamentally, but uh, there's a, definitely a political calculation there. But I would just say that even, even a deal that provides some t type of monetary relief, and people say that Kolomoisky will never go for anything but full return, to me is, I would think for the Ukrainian public would be a sellout. How can you, you know, handing more money over to somebody who already took billions seems to me um, to be to be almost criminal. And so I think I can't speak for Mr. Zelensky. It's a tough situation, but stick to his guns, um, and you know, and recognize that when you make tough political decisions, there's going to be some fallout. And eventually, at some point, I understood that they, Mr. Zelensky, had a certain honeymoon period in which he wanted to move legislation forward. But none of these things, he can't predict all the things that will happen. He couldn't predict um, the things that have happened over the last couple of months. And it's about you know him maturing in this position and taking some tough decisions. Sure. And his numbers are, are actually starting to slide now. We're, we're starting to see the end of that honeymoon. Paul, I think you wanted to jump in on, on Zelensky. Turn on your microphone, please. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one thing that I was, that I was mentioning is, is you know, I, I would agree with Jonathan. I mean, I think he needs to stick to his guns um, because you know, his numbers have been very high. He's had legitimacy, and he's only going to lose that legitimacy over time. Uh, and so the sooner he does this and the sooner he deals with, you know, tries to address Colmoise, it's going to mess up the entire sort of you know, shady political system that's behind the official political system, but I do think that that, that needs to be done, um, uh, or else it'll be too late. Um, uh, and I think, you know, there is a history of uh, in Ukraine, and I think, you know, we have somebody who's got uh, tremendous uh, personal legitimacy right now, who's got uh, tremendous legitimacy in the RADA, um, who's got a lot of power still, um, uh, and so now's, now's that time. Um, uh, to really try to deal with it, and I think now is the time where the United States, our European partners, but I think the United States across the board, in the administration, in Congress, really needs to sort of make that very clear um, in, in any way um, it has. Um, and, and then the second bit, you know, I think um, I think you do need to recommend, you know, recognize that he does have a lot of time now, but he really does need to get to work. And another bit was not just c c curbing corruption, but people wanted a better life. Um, uh, and so things like agricultural reform might help, you know, give some better, you know, better lives. Um, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things, improving services, um, uh, you know, making local governments more accountable. All of these types of things that are there um, uh, uh, are things that he really needs to work on. Um, and he's got strong partners right now in um, uh, Ukrainian civil society. It's one of the most impressive civil societies I've seen in the former Soviet Union, um, the former Soviet space right now. It's a model. Um, I go to Ukraine, I've gone to um, Kazakhstan, and they all look at what's happened in Ukraine over the past 10 years and see that as where they want to go. Um, and so I think you know, he's got a lot going for him, um, uh, but I think he needs to use his legitimacy um, and you know, be aware that he's going to take some hits and his, his polls are going to go down, but if he's successful, you know, it, it'll be good for him and it'll be good for Ukraine in the long run. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Luke and uh, Glenn, did you did you want to weigh in on Zelensky at all? No. Okay. Great. Yeah, I, I uh, getting back to the United States and the Paris meeting. I think that um, whatever Putin's strategy is, uh, the role of the United States here is we faced a very large setback with the loss of Kurt Volker, um, and Kurt's presence is something they call st strategic mentorship. And, and Kurt was trying to instill in the Ukrainian government uh, and in Zelensky, I think he took to great effect, he stiffened their spine. And I think with the loss of, of Kurt, that we have to find a way to keep stiffening Zelensky's spine uh, with some type of influence. Now, what I would be looking for is somewhere along the lines in the next, in the next day or two before the Paris meeting, but is to have a phone call from Pence uh, to kind of, you know, encourage Zelensky uh, and, and show the U.S. support, or Pompeo. And, and I think that would go a, a, great, a, great, go a great way in helping kind of to deal with the Macron factor uh, and letting these meetings not sensibly become just the Macron show. But I'm also more worried about Putin's salami tactics because with each meeting and each, each phase of, them, of Ukraine accepting uh, the Steinmeier formula, in some form, some, some shape, uh, is leading, what I fear is leading from one meeting to the next. 
with each step kind of further re-endorsing, re-entering the whole concept of direct negotiations with Donbass, which is Putin's end game. Now, we don't know what, what's going to come out of the meetings, but even if we don't see anything and there's going to be another round of meetings, it's again, it's progress and the effort of trying to create the impression that Russia is slowly uh, agreeing as it, uh, to, uh, to a rapprochement with Ukraine, that some type of end deal is in, in underway. We saw the return of the Gears of gunboats that were given back to uh, Ukraine recently. Uh, you know, that got a lot of uh, visibility and publicity in Europe. So that's what really um, is worrying me and wondering what's going to come out of the big what if of the meetings in Paris. Uh, and what is going to be the future U.S. role in this? Because we do play a role, and when our, our role is to f either clone Kurt or find somebody close to him. Uh, and so we got Ambassador Herbst over here. Uh, I'll, I'll, He's he gets, busy. Sorry. He, uh, we need gets, him. He gets my vote. But, but we have to find someone of Kurt's stature, uh, and that's, you know, to, to really help Ukraine and mentor them. And, and in this process, because we've got to play a role, and, I, and that's what worries me a lot. So I'll end on that note. Thank you. That, that's an excellent way uh, to conclude this. So I'd like to just go through the panel to summarize what you said. So uh, a call from Pence would be helpful. Uh, Hellfire missiles, a new Ukraine Support Act, and looking at, at the assistance figures, an attitude of tough love and mentorship. Uh, and a new Kurt Volker. Uh, is, is there anything else on the list uh, it, it, that you guys would want to put on the list for Congress to consider? Just, just one other thing. I mean, we haven't. We when we talk about Ukraine, we, we talk about politics, we talk about geopolitics, but sometimes we forget the human costs of what's going on in Ukraine. Um, the you know tremendous number of people who've been killed, the tremendous number of people who've been displaced and the tremendous number of people who experience extreme hardship. And I think as we have these conversations about geopolitics, Putin, you know, what we can do, I think we also need to remember that there is a, horrible, uh, a horrific situation going on um, in those communities, and, and we need to make sure that we can help those, those communities in addition to sort of the bigger picture as well. Terrific. Thank you. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, I would say patience. Uh, the reforms we're seeing in Ukraine are generational. It will be a generational change. It's going to take time. Uh, reforming your economy, your system of governance, your military, your security services, your courts, all while fighting a war is kind of like building a boat while you're already out at sea. And we need to understand that Ukraine is going to face many challenges along the way, and we should encourage them, but we shouldn't expect things to just improve overnight however frustrating that might be for us. I'm not sure how to quantify patience, but I, I've added it to the list. Alina, Jonathan, Glenn, anything else? Well, I think if we get all of the things on that list, that would be amazing. Um, so I would just uh, uh, double down on that. But uh, I think on, on the other hand, you know, it's, it's re so critically important. I was mentioning earlier more opaque and less direct terms than Glenn um, about U.S. presence and U.S coordination with our allies and Ukrainians and the Russians. And that's exactly what we lost with the loss of a special envoy. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that channel was maintained in the previous administration as well by Toria Newland, And that was then passed on to, to Kurt, more or less, to, Kurt, to Ambassador Volker. Uh, and I, I think this is going to be a very difficult position to fill, unfortunately. But someone has to have that portfolio. Uh, because otherwise, Ukraine is sort of left rudderless, I think. Um, in a very increasingly problematic geopolitical negotiating environment that we're going to see unfold in just a couple of days. Jonathan? No, I just, uh, more, more of this, more of the bipartisan focus. I think it will require um, a real effort to keep people focused on issues versus the political, you know, sort of whirlwinds all around. And I think if you do that, then um, that would probably, to me, is the most helpful thing to do is just to get people back on track, fo focusing on issues, focusing on how to work with, with partners like Ukraine. Um, thinking out of the box on the congressional side, I think is helpful because if you have a, a marker that you can set as to what Congress wants to see happen or the administration over a number of years, that's going to be most helpful to um, establishing the, the baselines. I want to think about Ukraine 2025 you know, as a vibrant democracy well on its way uh, to, to NATO membership or the EU, um, you know, and the United States central to the engagement, the same type of engagement that was critical to putting sanctions in place, that's been critical before in a number of diplomatic settings. That's where you need to get back to. 
Um, and not many people mention sanctions here, but that's also one area where, you know, sort of looking, re-looking at the, the sanctions related to the Donbass, taking a look at those related to Russia. Please remember Crimea in this process as well. Um, sometimes you see Normandy and it's almost as, as if the Crimea situation doesn't really exist in the diplomatic conversations. Um, but I think it's incredibly important because that was uh, precedent setting, illegal, um, and it has to be at the front of the conversation despite what, what certain people may feel as to uh, Russia's position. So please keep that on there. Please keep Crimea on the, on the list of things to focus on, but more of the same of this. And thank you to the Atlanta Council for your leadership in pulling this together and the congressional support as well. I, now it's my time to say thank you for being a wonderful audience, and I'd like to thank all of our partners, the American Enterprise Institute, the American Foreign Policy Council, Brookings, Carnegie, Heritage, SEPA, CSIS, GMF, and Jamestown Foundation. Thank you all so much. Let's continue to focus on Ukraine as it is and continue to push. It's a fantastic country, and it can be even more fantastic. Thank you so much for your attendance today.